I had asked, uh, I'd asked Mike to read from Titus chapter 3. I wanted you to see just how the Holy Spirit consistently brings, a, brings to us a common message. So in that text in Titus 3, it talks about how we were enslaved in sin, and now the kindness and mercy of God steps in and saves us, and then resulting in good works. And if you look at our, our, the text that we have been studying in Ephesians chapter 2, the very same pattern exists. That the first three verses that we have looked at in, in quite uh, detail uh, describes the slavery that we experience before coming to Christ. We are in slavery to sin and we're dead in sin and we're under God's wrath. And, the, and then verse 4 comes with this great phrase, you know, but God, but God steps in and, and then he, he saves us and, and then uh, gives us a new status. We're at God's right hand with Christ, seated in the heavenly places and then as a result, God wants us to be involved with good works. You know, you've, you've heard the phrase, somebody is so heavenly minded that they're no, they're no earthly good. Well, it, you know, it's not possible to be too heavenly minded. Uh, the more heavenly minded we are, the more earthly good we will be. And that's what comes out in our text in Ephesians chapter 2, is that in the, at the end of this, this section, verse 10, we're called to do good works. Well, we don't do good works in heaven in the same sense that we do them here. We'll be doing good in heaven, don't misunderstand. But there are good works that we can do now that we won't have the opportunity to do in heaven. And so, yes, we in God's mind, we're already in, in, in the presence of God. And yet, hey, I'm, my two feet are right here. Uh, my body is right here. God wants to use us right now. And that's the idea. That's the idea that... Um, what God saves us, he saves us to, to something where we begin to have impact in other people's lives. That's the good, the good works. And, and so, having looked at, now I want you to turn to Ephesians 2, please. So having looked at verses 1 to 3, and again, seeing this devastating description of our spiritual condition that we're dead in our trespasses and our sins in which we walked, and we walked according to the, to the spirit, the, the, that is the, um, the, the devil, the spirit of, of this age, uh, the, according to the ways of this world, we were enslaved to all that, and we were acting just in accord with the nature that we were born with, and then we were by nature children of wrath, under God's wrath. And so we, we have these three verses that describe this devastating spiritual condition. And now we come to the second half of this section, verses 4 to 10. And now we get to see how, what God does for us and how he intervenes in our life and how he saves us and he, and he makes us brand new to the point where now we want to be earthly good. We want to do good works uh, in this world for the glory of God and, and the good of others. So our outline this morning comes to us in four sections today. Our outline comes to us in four sections. They all have to do with our salvation because that's the theme of verses 4 to 10. And the first section is called, I'm going to call the cause of our salvation. The cause of our salvation. And then secondly, we're going to talk about the nature of our salvation. And then the third section is the purpose of our salvation. And then we'll end with the outcomes of our salvation. And so I want you to look, first of all, with me at the cause, the cause. And that begins in verse 4. And it's those two words, but God, but God. And we're told that the cause of our salvation is no one other than God. And we read about four characteristics of God as the reason why he saves us. And those four characteristics come to us as attributes of God. His mercy, his love, his grace, and his kindness. 
So if you ask the question, if you know Jesus this morning, I can tell you why. And the reason is God. And the reason is God's kindness, his mercy, his love, and his grace. And so it says there, but God, verse 4, but God being rich in mercy. Not just simply merciful, but rich in mercy. So when you think rich, what do you think of? I, I think of money. Okay, so I think of people in our world who have more money than they could possibly spend in a normal lifetime. So Jeff Bezos from Amazon and Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook and um, let's see, who else do I have here? Uh, Elon Musk and Tesla and SpaceX and, and Microsoft, Bill Gates and uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, what's his name? Warren Buffett, thank you, sir. Warren Buffett, and the list goes on and on. Uh, Carl Icahn and all these people, and I think money, riches. But God does not measure his, his wealth, his riches in dollars, even though he owns Tesla and Microsoft and SpaceX and Facebook. He, he, he owns that. That's his, by the way. God, that's, God owns that and every other square inch of this planet. That They're his. God owns that. And yet, his measure, the measure of his wealth is not in money. Yes, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But his, his wealth is measured in mercy, not money. Isn't that a wonderful thought? The God who owns it all doesn't measure his wealth the way we do. He says he is rich in mercy. So he has riches in mercy, and then he has great love. You see, uh, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love, not just love, but great love, uh, fantastic love, sacrificial love, great love, love that we're not worthy of, love that he chose to place upon us. He loved us, though, that we were by nature rebels and enemies of God. Great love. That's why we're saved. Rich in mercy, great love, and then grace. Look with me at verses 5 to 8. Look, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. And then it's as if Paul is saying, oh, i I, I got to say this, by grace by grace you have been saved. There's just no other explanation. By grace you have been saved. And then verse 6, and, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace, there it is again, grace, in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. So why are we saved? Because the riches of his mercy his great love, and his, his grace that is immeasurable, his immeasurable grace, the grace that can't even be measured, that is the reason why we are saved. And so this wonder of wonders that God, because of his great grace, gave his son to bear the wrath for my sin that I deserve. This is grace. This is the cause of our salvation. There's what, that one other um, attribute that mentioned in verse 7. I read it. It says, the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is God's heart for us as sinners. God's heart is to be kind to, to sinners. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He takes pleasure in saving sinners and making them his adopted daughters and sons. He is kind. And so he is rich in mercy. He has great love. He has grace that can't be measured. And he is kind. And this is the cause for why we have been saved. This is why God chose a people to, to be his very own. And so for all eternity... We will praise him for his mercy and his love and grace and kindness. And yet, 
even though that's something coming, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, what will happen in eternity, the application of, of why or the cause of our salvation, that applies to us right now. Because the very characteristics of God that are the reason why we are saved are the very characteristics that we are to treat one another with. If you hold your place in chapter 2 and just skip over one page in your Bible to chapter 4 and verse 31, you'll see these characteristics now and, and a call to us to apply them to our relationships. So Ephesians 4, verse 31, here Paul writes, and this is part of the put off, put on motif of, of growing and changing in Christ. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. That's what we put off, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and, and malice. That's just, let it go, just put it off, he says. Verse 32, be kind, there's the kindness. You see, God is, has been kind to us. Paul is saying, verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. How's that? As God in Christ forgave you. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, do what? Be imitators of God. As beloved children, there's his love. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Can you see the parallel that in the coming ages, we're going to talk about um, that in a moment. The coming ages will, this will, will uh, worship God for all these things. But the application for us now is that we can actually exercise those characteristics, those qualities in our relationships with other people. And so the same grace that has come to us is the grace that we ought to give to one another. So I ask you the question, have you been challenged in this recently? Has God brought to your attention, even as we're talking this morning about a relationship where you need to let go of the bitterness, wrath, and anger, and malice that kind of naturally rises up because we still have a sinful nature, and, and instead ask God for grace that you can exercise the kind of kindness and grace and mercy that you've been shown, that would be an application right now of, of the cause of your salvation. The cause of our salvation is God's grace and love and mercy and kindness. Now go show that to others. So that's the, that's the cause of our salvation. But now I want you to see the nature of it. How does God describe it? The nature. So we have the cause all those characteristics. Now the, the, now the nature of our salvation. That, and, and I see three things in this text that are the nature. The re, um, they're kind of figures of speech. Resurrection, union with Christ, and creation. Um, they, they will describe for us the nature of what it means to be saved. So the first is resurrection. And again, that comes to us in verses 4 and 5 here of our text, Ephesians 2, 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, what does the text say happens? It says, made us alive. Made us alive. Now, there's more there, and we'll get to it. But that's a resurrection. And so when I think of that, that analogy of resurrection that I think immediately of the miracle that occurred to, with Lazarus in John chapter 11. And I think that God put the story of the raising of Lazarus as a way of picturing for us exactly what God does for us in resurrecting our dead soul to life. So <clears throat> the raising of Lazarus, is like our salvation in that, like Lazarus, we are dead in our sins. Like Lazarus, we were unable to move ourselves toward God, but we first needed to be made alive. As a result of the life given to him, 
Lazarus responded to Jesus' call. Remember the story? You know, Jesus came up to the tomb and he said, uh, much to the chagrin of all those grieving people, he said, roll away the stone. And of course they said, mm, wait a minute, he's been in there for four days. There's going to be an incredible stench. But they didn't realize that Jesus was already at work in, in the dead man Lazarus. And so he said, remove the stone. And, and then he cried out. Jesus, first he prayed, Father, I thank you that you always hear me. I said this because I, for the benefit of those around me. And then he, I don't know if he said amen or what, but then he said, Lazarus, come forth. And out came the dead man. And in the same way, God speaks to our dead heart and makes us alive and grants repentance and faith he doesn't believe for us. No, no, we believe, but we, but we believe because God first grants to us the faith that we need to trust in Him as Lord and Savior. And so we respond to the gospel. But God is the one responsible for allowing us and making us able to respond to the gospel. He gives us new life. And that's what He means there in the text in verse 5. Even when we were dead... He made us alive, just like Lazarus. So now we've been given life, and now we can come to Christ. We can respond to Christ's call. That's resurrection. That's a picture. That's the nature of our salvation. This is nothing less than a resurrection from the dead. But then there's another way of describing the nature of our salvation, and that's in verses 5 and 6. Look at verse 5 again. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive. Now, the next words, see, together with Christ. Together with Christ. And then verse, verse 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. When Jesus was crucified, we were crucified. In Christ Jesus, when he was buried, we were buried. In Christ Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, we were raised. In Christ Jesus, when, when he ascended back to the Father and was seated at God's right hand, according to this text, all those things happened to us. We were raised with him, verse 6, and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ. It's a little prefix glued to the main verbs of raised up and seated with Christ. It's the word with. Raised up with. Seated with. Christ. This is what happened with a made alive with Christ, raised up with Christ, seated with Christ. Go back to chapter 1, verse 19. There we read about the immeasurable greatness of God's power displayed uh, when it says in verse 20 that he worked in Christ. This is chapter 1, verse 20. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now we're reading in chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, that what happened to Jesus, we got included with that. We are in union with him. And so he has joined us to what he did for Jesus, made alive, raised, and seated at God's right hand. Now, this is part of the already slash not yet tension that we live in the Christian life. I mean, you and I know that we sit here or stand here and we've got a physical body. I am where I am. What do you mean I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly realms? I'm here. I'm not there. I'm here. So this is not a description of a geographical location. This is a description for us of a new status. 
This, and this is why Paul would say, oh, by grace you've been saved. Because I'm gonna, I want you to see what God has done for you. He has taken a person who is dead in the grave, who stinks, so to speak, spiritually, before Christ. It's before God, our lives are not pleasing to him. And, and he takes us and he speaks life into us. And, and, and now we're not just, not just walking around, but... But we have a new status. We're, we're in Christ. And where Jesus is, God says, you're already there. In his eyes, we're already there. Even though physically, we are here. We sit in a physical body, in a geographical location. And yet at the same time, we are seated with Christ. So I see at least three applications for this. Number one is the idea of security. If God sees me already as seated with Christ in the heavenly realms at God's right hand, who is going to climb up to heaven, so to speak? Who is going to yank us if we are believers? How is anyone, including the devil, going to, to take that status away? Can anybody do that? God put us there, nobody can change this status. And so I know that there are some people uh, in, uh, in our world that teach that, you know, you can get saved and then you can lose your salvation. But this text tells us that we have security in Christ, that we are as good as there, that, that it's as good as done. Christ is your salvation. It's not, as, it's not about how strong then your grip is on Jesus, but it is about how strong his grip is on you. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on the power of God. And God has said, in his mind, you're already there if you're a believer in Jesus. That's wonderful news. That's, that's a fruit of being united to Jesus. But then there's another application that I see, and that is not just security, that we know our future, but that there's a sense of authority. Now, let me explain what I mean. If Christ is exalted far above all evil powers, and if we are in Christ, with Christ, seated with Christ in the heavenly realms at God's right hand, then that means that when we fight our spiritual battles against evil, we fight from the position of strength. You see, the devil wants us to see ourselves as itty-bitty little ants that he's going to crush. And truly, he, he would, but were it not for our position in Jesus. But rather, we're not little itty-bitty ants that, that the devil can crush, but rather we are in Christ, seated with Christ at God's right hand, and we fight our spiritual battles from a position of authority and strength. So that, so that, when you look at chapter 6, verse 10, just page over there, just for a moment, when he writes, Paul writes, finally, Ephesians 6, 10, finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. The, where does that come from? Where does that strong in the Lord come from? It comes from our position as being in Christ, seated with Christ, at God's right hand. And so we're not, from God's perspective, lowly and weak, ready to be crushed by Satan. Rather, the Bible says in Romans, the God of peace, he, Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's the position from which we do spiritual warfare and, and resist what I mean by spiritual warfare is resisting his schemes, his distractions, uh, his diversions, his discouragements. We fight from a position of power and authority. Now that is not to say, please listen to this now, that is not to say that we cannot give up ground to the devil. Again, if you Look at chapter 4, part of that put off, put on section. And you look at chapter 4 and verse 26. Paul says, be angry. You see it? 
Chapter 4, verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give, and then what's the next verse? Verse 27. And give no opportunity to the devil. The word opportunity is, is, can be translated space or a foothold. You know how it works. You just, if you just get your foot into the door, you can't, the, the door literally can't be closed. That's exactly what happens when we give place to the devil with unresolved anger or bitterness or malice. That's why he says later on in that chapter, jettison all that. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Put it off. That gives place to the devil. And then what happens is, as that grows, then, then there's two feet in the door. And then there are, the shoulders are in the door, so to speak. And then what happens is spiritual strongholds develop where we are really re-enslaved to certain sin. And then we have to do battle with the devil and pray, and we need to renounce the sin that we've you know, uh, gotten into and call upon the Lord, worship the Lord, renounce Satan, renounce the sin we're in, and, and claim the position that we already have. That position cannot change. It's a position of authority and strength, seated with him, with Christ, in the heavenly places, in Christ. So that's an application of our union with Christ, security, authority, and I think also intimacy with God. After all, if you are in Christ and you are seated at God's right hand, how far away can you be? There's a sense of access to God, access to Him in Christ, seated at God's right hand, access to God. That's intimacy with Him. We can come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and help in our time of need. And so these, these pictures... These, these metaphors of, of salvation, resurrection, union with Christ, and then uh, intimacy, or excuse me, creation, creation. And that's verse 10. Look at verse 10 with me. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Created in Christ Jesus. So creation describes salvation. When, when we come to know the Lord, uh, it's like we're raised from the dead. We are united to Jesus Christ and everything that God did for him, he does for us. And salvation is like we're all new. Now, it's not a renovated you. It's not a repaired you. It's not a 2.0 version of you. It's a transformed you. It's you are completely new. You are liberated from slavery to sin, slavery to Satan's ways and the world. You're rescued from condemnation. And so we are all new. We're not upgraded. We are totally transformed. And, and that verb in verse 10, we are his workmanship, uh, so, uh, John Stott, you know, one of the commentators that I read, he sometimes he'll, ha he'll give his, his translation of some of the, the sentences and he translate that, translates that verb. We are his masterpiece. Masterpiece. Because if you pronounce the Greek word, it's poema, which sounds like poem, doesn't it? God, you know, he's, he's at work doing works of art in our lives. We're created. He, the, the master worker, the master artist is at work creating new you, not an upgraded you, but a whole new you, a transformed you. Isn't that wonderful? You know, when I think about these things, it reminds me that if, if my salvation is nothing less than a resurrection from the dead, a union with Christ, and a new creation, the fact is, Right there, that all closes the door on any involvement that I might have in saving myself. The last thing I can do is make my dead self alive. The last thing I can do is somehow unite myself to Jesus. The last thing I can do is create myself. <laughs> That's a work of God, beginning to end. It's all of God. That's the point 
Paul's trying to make is that you didn't bring to the table anything for your salvation. You brought just you, and God saved you who are in Christ. So, to review, the cause of our salvation, that's God's mercy and grace and love and kindness. The nature of our salvation, resurrection, union with Christ, new creation. And then I want you to see third, the purpose of of our salvation, the purpose. Look at verse 7. So why does God do all this, right? So he, verse 6, it says he raises up, seated us with Christ in heavenly places. Verse 7 is so that. There's a purpose clause now. So that what? In the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So in the coming ages, what we're going to do in eternity is is be trophies of God's grace that we'll be able to see with one another and it'll all point to God's grace and Jesus' sacrifice. And it'll, I I have this hunch. Now this is a hunch. Actually, I have no idea if this will occur. But I wonder if in heaven, Every day, Jesus will conduct a grace class. Every day, he's going to tell us a little more about what, how much God, how, how thrilled he is to have us as his children because of the sacrifice that Jesus made to buy us. And that there'll be a, <laughs> will there be a grace class every day? That I think we'll need one. Because it's, we're just, these are described as the immeasurable riches of his kindness. There, there's just, it's eternal. It's infinite. It's unfathomable. And so for eternity, God's grace will be on display. One commentator I, I read talked about how a first century Christian might hear this. And he said that it wasn't, he, he said that it was common for a conquering king, when he would come back from battle, he would bring spoils of the victory, signs of the, the, great, the great victory in, in whatever battle it was. It might be, you know, ornate shields of the enemy that were captured or any, any kind of, of uh, memorabilia that would, that would remind him and others of the, of the battle of his victory and he would take those, those objects and he would place them in the temple of his God, his idolatrous God. And so temples were often a little like museums because they would display the spoils of war. This is what happened in this battle. Now, here, here's you know, three or four things from that battle. And, and it was all meant to, it was all meant to say, see, this is how great my small g, O-D, my God is. You see what I'm saying? And so what Paul is saying, we, for reasons known only to God himself, we are those, are the memorabilia of God's grace in his great heaven that God puts us on display of his grace and mercy for eternity. And maybe, you know, we'll get to hear testimonies because we, uh, how many testimonies have you not heard of all God's people? I, hey, there's a lot of testimonies you haven't heard. There's millions of testimonies. You get to hear and see. And, you know, uh, it's wonderful to read about them now. How wonderful it'll be for eternity when his mercy and grace will be on display. And so... I would say the application for us today is is don't wait until then to put God's grace on display. I mean, it'll be it'll be fun in eternity. But think about now, how much grace and mercy has He had on you? Think of the remember the story in the Gospels of the uh, man who was possessed by multiple demons, and Jesus spoke the word and and removed them all. And and up to that point, before Jesus came to him. Uh, 
he was out of his, literally out of his mind. Nobody could control him. And Jesus delivered him, and he was now, it says in the Gospels, he was clothed and in his right mind, and he wanted, he wanted to get back in the boat because it was right along the, the, lake, the, sea of, the shores of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus was going to leave, and he said, can I come with you all? And Jesus, what did he say? He said, stay here and go tell everybody how much God has had mercy on you. And it says, that's what he did. And it says, in the region of the Decapolis, which means ten cities, he taught. I mean, the word, everybody kind of knew this guy. Like, he was the, you know, the talk of the town or towns. And there he was, going around from city to city saying, yeah, I was that guy. I was that guy. That was me. But somebody came and transformed my life, and his name is Jesus, and he can do the same for you. He put Jesus on display. I, I, that's what will happen in eternity, but I, I think it can also happen now. And so when you, when you think about, well, what's the purpose of salvation? It's, it's put, to put God's grace on display for all eternity, but certainly now. But there's another purpose. There's another purpose. And look at verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, meaning grace and salvation and even faith. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's all a gift of God. Verse 9. Not a result of works. Another purpose cause is coming. Not, a result, not as a result of works. Second half of verse 9. So that. No one may boast. Do you get a sense of how much God hates pride? He's saying, I, I did all this because I'm putting my own glory and grace on display. And, and, I, and so that you will have nothing to boast about except God. You boast about God. And so no one can boast. It's all a gift of God. It's not a result of works. Look at me, look at me, look at me. No, 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 no. It's all about God. So there's no boasting. So if you're going to boast, it says, that your boasting be in the Lord. Boast of the gospel. Boast how God opened your heart to believe. Opened your eyes to see and your ears to hear. Boast about how God, for reasons known only to himself, chose you and brought you to faith in him. Boast about God. But there's no other boasting. And God saves us to silence all human boasting. So, that leads us to our fourth and final section of our sermon. And that is the outcome of our salvation. And that is nothing more than, or nothing less than, to walk in good works. To walk in good works. For the latter part of verse 10, it says, well, let me just read all of verse 10. For we are his workmanship, his poem, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus, there's the creation, for good works, for good works. See, that's the reason, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ever since I began looking at, in detail, in this section, verses 1 to 10, the, one of the first things that became so clear was that verse 1 had the idea of walking in something, and verse 10 had the idea of walking in something. Do you see? Look at chapter 2, verse 1. You were dead in the, tra in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Right? And then verse 10. Where his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Walk. So our walk has changed. That walk, manner of life, from slavery to sin, into the ways of the world, led astray by the devil, to a walk in God's good works that he has prepared in advance. Not saved by good works, but we're saved unto good works, that, that when we are saved, God, one of the first evidences of that salvation is that we desire to do good works. And so as I studied this, I asked myself the question, because, you know, sometimes you'll read 
the, the, a writer in the New Testament, and they'll say something, and you say, I understand it, but what does it look like? So it, he says that we would walk in these good works that God prepared beforehand. So I ask the question, what are these good works that are pre, pre-planned by God? What are these good works? So uh, I have a couple thoughts for you about these good works prepared in advance for us to walk in. First, okay, anything that the Lord commands in this book, in his word, anything that he commands for us to do, when we do it, that's a good work. Because that's just the very opposite of where we were living before Christ. We were walking in disobedience and walking in the lust of our flesh. Now, when we obey God, we're, we're walking in those good works. That's part of it. So, it, you know, don't mystify this. Don't say, oh, today, what good works shall it be? <laughs> Now, I, I, I want to say something about that, too. Don't, don't, don't go off too far with that. I want to say, but I want you to see that the normal, natural meaning of what Paul means here is that we just take the Word of God seriously every day, and we just put it into practice. And every time we put it into practice, that's a good work. That's the good work that he, God has prepared in advance. You, this is a lot of pre plan good works. Just walk in the word and follow God. That, that's certainly part of it. So uh, by knowing and doing God's word, we're going to be naturally directed in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds to what is right, to what is good, to what is profitable, to what is holy. And so all of life then, as we obey God's word, becomes good works. And it's like a puzzle, you know, a thousand-piece puzzle. And you get, you know, you get the framework, and, you know, the more pieces that you get put in there, the clearer and the more distinct the picture is of what the puzzle is picturing. And, and as we obey God in a, in a habitual way, it's like putting more and more pieces of that puzzle together and and when it takes shape what what's being portrayed is the good works that bring glory to God and so as it fills in as our life fills in with more and more of the good works that he has for us and obeying God's word our, our life takes shape as bringing glory to God and then of course joy to us and so he, he tells us what he wants us to do. Those are the good works. But let me hasten to add that I I think it's a very fruitful and profitable prayer to pray every day to say, God, what are some of the good works that you want me to accomplish today? Help me. Because here's the thing. Not every good work that God has for us is already on our schedule that we know about. God is a God who's always at work, and he wants to use us in so many different ways. So if we just make ourselves available to him and say, each day, in addition, Lord, to all the things that you want me to do as a child of God and obeying your word, show me anything specific that, that you want me to do that would be one of those pre-planned good works. So you see, it's kind of a dual thing where, you know, you don't have to wonder what the good works are. It's the scriptures. And yet it's a, it's a thrill to be able to be led by God daily into good works that you didn't even see coming. There they are. And you, oh, and you have an opportunity to serve someone, to bless someone, to encourage them, to share the gospel. All those kind of things happen because God's at work, uh, showing us the good works that he has for us. So what are those good works? Well, they certainly are um, all the things that he has for us in his word, the things that he has for us that we don't know about till they come and we just respond to, to them. And I think another answer to that question, what are these good works, have to do with our own spiritual gifts. 
that how has God wired us? How has God gifted us spiritually? That's another way we can discover the good works that he has for us. What do you really enjoy doing? What, what do you do that, that seems to be especially blessed by God? And, and so do that. That's part of those good works. Go for it, in other words. I think another one is discipleship. That would certainly be a part of the commands of God, that we, we disciple one another, uh, that we, we find someone or another person and we meet with them and we share God's word together and we, we disciple other people. We share the gospel with other people. That's certainly a good work. I think meeting needs within the family of God. These are all good works. I, I don't have time to tell you. I just I went through the New Testament and I, I looked up all the references to good works and it's just, there are just many. So you, you should not lack. <laughs> you should not lack for any, any opportunities to do good. God will show you, I guarantee you. And so what we have here then is a transformed life. It starts... We started out with deadness and sin and trespasses and walking in the ways of this world, following the, the ways of Satan, doing what, our, our, what we, the nature that we were born with said to do, and we were under God's wrath. And we end here at verse 10 with, now we're God's workmanship. We're new creations. We're not upgrades. We're new creations. We're transformed. And now we're walking in good works. Listen, give me Jesus any day. You can have the rest of the world. <laughs> give me Jesus. Let's, let's follow him in, in these good works that he has for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this special uh, text text that is that was ours today. Thank you for the good news of the gospel, the transforming work that you do. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, your kindness and your love. We thank you, Lord, for how you have, have saved us and you have united us to Jesus. You have made us new creations. You've raised us from the dead. Oh, we thank you that we'll have eternity to put your grace on display, and we can do it now. Use us, Lord, to do that. And we thank you for these good works that you have for us to do. Lead us each day to do them, to glorify you in them, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.